Hi everyone, it's Mark Thurman with the Connected Things 2021 event, and I'm recording uh, another fireside chat or discussion in support of our conference, which is all about 5G this year. I'm here with uh, Bill Flaherty, who's just told me how they pronounce his last name uh, in Ireland, which you knew was going to creep up on you after you told me. But I'll have him introduce himself and then more appro appropriately have him pronounce his name in uh, two different uh Two different languages, uh, but I'm really pleased uh, to have Bill on. Bill's part of uh, Very Possible, who have been a long-term sponsor of ours, which we continue to appreciate. And they sponsored, you know, our, our live uh, conferences, which, as uh, if you're watching this, you probably are aware, have been running, and you know, at the MIT Media Lab. Due to COVID, this is our second year in a row doing this digitally. But I want to announce that. Sometime in the fall, right after Labor Day, we will most likely have some sort of live event at the Media Lab. We're working on scheduling it now. This is uh, early summer, if you're listening to this late. And then we will resume uh, our program in the springtime, 2022, for the full day program at the MIT Media Lab. So uh, please watch our website for news on Connected Things 2022. But we're still in 2021. So, Bill. Who are you? Who do you work for, even though I just mentioned it? And what do you do for them? Yeah, so uh, Bill Flaherty, or uh, as the Irish pronounce it, Flaherty. Uh, but I am the Harbor Practice Lead uh, at, at Very. So we are a, a IoT-focused uh, consultancy. So we do IoT product development for a variety of clients. And uh, I lead up our, our team of hardware engineers who help provide solutions to our clients for electrical, mechanical uh, integrations. And as any good hardware person uh, should be doing while they're in the middle of an interview, you've got your uh, 3D printer printing something away. What, what, what is that? Yeah, so I couldn't, you know, I couldn't be on camera without having my 3D printer going uh, since it sits behind me. But uh, I'm actually printing up an uh, enclosure for one of our clients for a prototype that we're building for them. It's just a small uh, wireless uh, electronics box. But... You know, rather than having to go out to a manufacturer and do it, I can print it here in my home office and have it uh, shipped off to them in the afternoon. Well, which is cool. So we'll we'll get to kind of how work has changed in the era of era of COVID and post COVID. I'll note for the audience that our website actually contains uh, last year's conversation with uh, with uh, our friends at Vary, which included a discussion right at the beginning or the early stages of the COVID pandemic and. It included the CTO of Vizio, one of uh, their clients, talking about remote working, not only internally at his company, but also in collaboration with a partner like Very. But so let's jump in. This is all about 5G. I'm not going to ask you to define the 5G standard or, you know, release 15 or whatever it is. But what does 5G mean to you in the, in the context of your practice? And what do you what do you think the importance is for your clients. Yeah, so uh, the analogy I always like to use with 5G to me is it's like when Eisenhower built the freeways, right? Like before we're running on county roads and you can go pretty quickly on county roads and, you know, they run straight into where you need to go, but then you build the freeways and now you, know, you can get across the country in a couple of days rather than, uh, you know, a couple of months. And so it's that kind of combination of increased throughput and reduction in latency that make it such an interesting, uh, interesting technology. Now, from a hardware perspective, the thing to me is like, if you have freeways, you can't drive on them with Model Ts and like make it useful, right? So we need to make sure that the hardware that we're bringing along the way can really take advantage of um, those increases in throughput and, and decreases in latency. So are you seeing things like, you know, uh, modules that are 5G capable now on the market? Again, for, you know, the frame this up for the listener, this is uh, early summer 2021. So are you seeing the existence of hardware modules supporting 5G and the various 5G speeds and feeds? And are you seeing that those modules available at a reasonable price so that they can actually be used in a deployment? Yeah, so I'd say it's still, it's starting to trickle out into the market, but it sure, certainly has not uh, kind of inundated things in the way that we can get with, say, LTE or, or some of the other wireless standards. So it's certainly not as widespread yet. In terms of availability and price, you know, we're right in the middle of this uh, this chip shortage right now, and that is hitting really everybody across the board. Um, and so, just availability of anything 
from you know a 5G module all the way down to uh, the most basic microcontroller, it has been a challenge. And so, you know, I think we've been trying to take that. We we use kind of an agile uh, development techniques here at Barry. That's helped us kind of deal with this. But uh, yeah, the chip shortage in general is just a challenge for everybody right now. So uh, is that resulting in delays, uh, deployment delays, or is that resulting in you know, different design challenges? So it's a, it's a little bit of column A and a little bit of column B. I'd say uh, for products that are kind of ready to enter production, there's certainly been um, some delays that we're seeing. Uh, in terms of development, it's you're still able to get kind of the, the onesie, twosie type uh, you know, quantities that you need to build prototypes, to push design forward, right? And so you know, if you're starting a design project now, you might actually end up being well poised because by the time that development finishes, you know, hopefully we'll start to see a, a you know, a abatement of this, of this shortage. Um, but it also does impact designs, right? I mean, you need to migrate towards things that you can actually get stock of. Um, and so, you know, one of the things we started doing at the beginning of our programs is doing a supply chain analysis of what's out there, what can we get, you know, is the lead time on this specific STM32 99 weeks, and this other one is, you know, 20 weeks, well, you know, maybe we need to design around that. And, uh, and make some design decisions that are more uh, focused for that so that we can make sure we have parts available to us. So are you buying parts on behalf of your clients as part of the entire uh, deployment? It depends. Uh, typically for prototyping, we will, because we'll do the prototyping, you know, I mean, I say in-house in all of our houses since we're a remote company, um, but we will do uh, the purchasing for that. And then when we kind of transition to what I'll call large scale manufacturing. So maybe after a, an initial production run um, and they're ready to kind of enter market, build these larger numbers, that's when we would hand off uh, kind of the manufacturing and supplier relationships to the client. Um, but we help to manage that, right? We want to make sure that they're in a good place. We're not just handing them, you know, a, a list with buy this, buy this, buy this. No, we want to make sure that there's distributors in place, manufacturers in place that we know. Um, that can execute this, that have started to build um, tooling around it, and that they can just kind of run with. Uh, it makes good sense. So assuming things return to normal, um, I guess, you know, my, my first question, since again, you're, you're in the mix with, with clients and with the uh, vendor community and what's going on, what sorts of deployments that you guys are seeing require absolutely 5G? So it's, I, I always, I, I struggle with absolutes because I think that it really depends so specifically on the things that you're trying to do. And I mean, we talked about this before, I think places where we need latency and where you need like big outdoor deployments, that's where we're going to see a lot of 5G um, come into play, play and be important. Um, you know, it's the, the, the rise of Wi-Fi 6 kind of alongside um, a 5G kind of prevents, they each have their own compelling use case. I mean, it's half the throughput for Wi-Fi 6, but, you know, uh, 20 gigabits per second for 5G, that's a, that's a lot of throughput. And not, you know, a lot of IoT de uh, deployments don't really need that. So I right. think where we'll see these things are, you know, big industrial operations, mining, uh, manufacturing, areas where you have these large distributed areas um, where you want very rapid communication um, and connectivity with large amounts of data. So, uh, you know, take a factory, for example, that might spread over, you know, hundreds of thousands of acres. Um, you know, you're building part A and like the whole, you know, absolute left end of the factory, part B up through right into the factory. And you want those machines talking to each other and providing, say, you know, machine learning type things, um, edge compute, being able to send that data back and forth rapidly at, at high volumes, I think will, will really allow and enable some new applications that'll be interesting. Are you seeing things in the, with respect to edge? You know, the industrial and edge are typically mentioned in the same uh, in the same light. Are you guys seeing things? Are you getting RFPs, RFIs? Uh, are you deploying MEC, uh, which is edge computing scenarios in private five G or private LTE scenarios? Is that part of your your guys' offering? Yeah, so we we definitely started to see folks more interested in edge compute. Um, I'd say it's still. Uh, a little bit at the, I guess, the bleeding edge of where people are, are looking right now, but certainly um, edge compute deployments, mesh networks, that's stuff that we're doing right now that we're deploying right now. I mean, a, a great example of that that you can find on our website is the work we've done with Sun and their Helios um, product. And so that's an industrial IoT uh, edge compute 
Uh, it currently does machine learning right at a um, in, in the cloud, but there's a lot of uh, machine learning that goes on there for analytics and, and things like that. But I think what we'll see is is that, like you said, move out towards the edge so we can make more rapid decisions, right? And that's again where 5G can play a role because if we can get that data at a low latency um, out to these you know remote places, then you can make those decisions much faster as that data comes in. So we've had this debate um, over the past few years, and I'll admit my um, my prejudice, for lack of a better term. I come from a telco background. I tend to think uh, that you know cellular based uh, IoT connectivity is the way to go for a number of reasons, including flexibility. Now with uh, 5G and all the flavors of 5G, which include narrowband, CAN M, and Wi-Fi is actually considered under the umbrella anyway. But I tend to think that cellular is a better way to go because you can go from an individually addressable asset, you know, a thing, to things that are, you know, having a IoT hubs where you do a little bit of, you know, uh, mesh networking to a hub, et cetera. Uh, what's your view? Uh, and also security, I, I would say the security model on cellular IoT typically is better because um, it's a managed service offering by default because that's what the cell network providers do is they it, they provide a managed service offering. But there's pricing differences. What, from your perspective, are the strengths and weaknesses of Wi-Fi versus uh, cellular IoT? Yeah, so I, I think um, you're exactly, I think a lot of the points that you raised are exactly right. I think the, the real benefit to me that Wi-Fi brings is it's, uh, there's a lot less overhead to manage, right? Almost any internal IT department can stand up and roll out a Wi-Fi system with uh, without too much trouble. But that comes along with some of the downsides you said. One of the big ones, security. Right. right? I mean, Wi-Fi is only as good as your network password. Um, and while those can be, you know, relatively secure, they can't approach the security of, say, like a private 5G or even a, a telecom 5G network. Um, and so... You know, the, the downside, I would say, also to both 5G and Wi-Fi is, you know, operating at, at higher frequencies, penetration through walls, through trees, foliage, things like that. So I think what we will see is these kind of managed mesh networks with centralized hubs um, and those hubs being able to report out. I think the thing that I like uh, for, uh, for 5G over Wi-Fi is that it kind of it doesn't matter where that hub is. Right. I mean, you can be in the middle of the woods somewhere. Right. As long as you have the connectivity and the network that exists, um, it doesn't require as much uh, infrastructure to get the data out. Right. Because right? that infrastructure is handed by the handled by the telecom companies. And so uh, I think it makes uh, installation in areas where, you know, Wi-Fi might be more of a challenge, a little bit easier. Uh, and then on top of that, like you get the increased data rate, the decreased latency. Um, and so I think, you know, industrial applications, places like, um, like we talked about factories, mines, I think we'll really see them latching on to 5G over Wi-Fi. Um, and then on top of that, the idea that you don't have to be bouncing around between hotspots, you don't have to worry about that, um, will be a big benefit as well. So if I widen the, the, uh, the frame a little bit, you've got sort of this notion of licensed versus unlicensed as well. Mm. Uh, and again, my I admit my my biases, my biases towards license through cell operators. Um, there, to me, cell operators are pretty darn good at several things. One is acquiring spectrum and allocating it, and you know, putting these uh, managed uh, networks out there. They're also pretty good at sending a bill, which is not um, it's not a normally mentioned uh, asset because uh, a lot of people resent getting bills, I suppose, but. You know, unlicensed has its strengths and weaknesses as well. So do you guys look at engagements that are in the unlicensed er arena? And, you know, what sorts of things are you seeing there? Yeah, I, I think there'll always be a place for, for unlicensed, I think. Um, in particular, you know, if we go way down the, the spectrum, the, the 900 megahertz band has so much utility just from uh, its penetration and its, its range. That I think that's there are always going to be use cases for that, but uh, I think in general, unlicensed has a lot of challenges when you talk about that you know the last mile of data, right? Getting it from the local to the global, out to the cloud, and so, so the, it's, it's the backhaul issue is what you're exactly, yeah, and and that's where I think you know really the licensed spectrum and and working with through the telecoms, that's you get so many benefits there. And, 
yeah, there is a bill associated with it, but uh, I mean, it's the the reality of IoT that if you're trying to to haul data that you can access anywhere in the world, that costs money, right? And right. I mean, you know, no unlicensed spectrum is going to be able to provide you the benefits that you need to really run a, a modern IoT network um, in, in a sustainable way. And so I think, you know, like I said, there's a there's a place for kind of everyone at the table, but um, for that backhaul, I think there's really no uh, replacement for for licensed work through the, the telecoms. No, I, again, I, I my bias was uh, was uh, uh, noted at the at the onset of that question. But so uh, another thing I've observed over the past several years is that it's the rise and dominance of the hyperscalers, you know, AWS, uh, Microsoft, Azure, Google, etc. Uh, what kind of interaction do you guys have with that? Do you, aside from uh, store and compute, what other, uh, you know, just from a generic standpoint, what other tools might you use in a deployment from a hyperscaler? You know, I mean, I'm not, I'm not asking to name a specific tool or service, but what kinds of things would you, when you build a deployment, you know, are are you trying to adhere to a set of requirements to use S3 storage or? you know, uh, Azure IoT, how does that all work? Yeah, so uh, I'll, I will admit, you know, I'm a little out of my depth in this topic area because I'm the, no, you're I'm the hardware, hardware guy. guy. I see but, this uh, thing printing behind you. you. Know, know. Yeah, so, but uh, that being said, I think one of the things that we always try to bring to any engagement is flexibility, right? right? And so we've worked kind of across multiple of these different hyperscalers, right? I mean, we've done AWS, we've done Azure. It's, it really depends on the client's needs and figuring out exactly what um what kind of tooling that they need and like some of that can be anything from uh analytics to being able to scale from small to big right we have clients who have started with 10 devices in the field with plans to scale to hundreds of thousands right and being able to build a single system so that you can do that scaling without having to kind of redo your entire code base at some point because oh hey you know, the, sorry, that hosting service we decided to use way back when it's fallen on its face. It, it can't handle it. You know, that's that's what we want to avoid. We want to make sure that we can provide continuity um, through the project without having to do, you know, huge amounts of rework uh, down the line as, as folks want to scale. So, um, yeah, I think, I don't know if I answered exactly, but that's, <laughs> yes. You have to speak your truth. Yeah. I'm sorry, it was just too easy. <laughs> Um, and that wasn't, a, it wasn't meant to be a, <laughs> a trick question. So, you know, back to kind of the hardware side. So we, you know, private 5G and 5G networks, you know, edge, you've got this notion of mech and you've got this notion of 5G routers, by the way, my, for my friends in the UK, that word was routers. Um, are, are you seeing, you know, the avail, the availability of 5G edge compute and 5G routers? I, I and in particular, things that are for the IoT world rather than from the consumer world. Yeah, I think, uh, like I said before, we're starting to see that kind of trickle onto the market. Uh, it certainly doesn't have uh, as widespread availability as you know the ability for me to go and pick up a, a basic LTE modem. Right, I could I could do that in ten seconds. It might take a little bit more, but the five G parts are definitely out there, right? And and they're starting to come into play. I think from what we've seen from our clients is. They are still viewing 5G more as a uh, a mobile telephone technology, right? And so that's more on on our end. We've been working to educate them about, hey, no, like this is something that we can bring to your deployments that might have benefits for you. Um, and so I think that's that's just more of a a perception thing that it's not as wi widely understood that this is a technology um, that can impact IoT. And so you know, we've been working hard to kind of educate our clients around that. Um, where we think it makes sense for uh, uh, for their application. So, you know, uh, one of the other conversations I know that I've participated in this cycle for the conference have been, you know, is 5G just another G? <laughs> um, I know from, you know, doing this for a number of years that, um, again, in IoT, it used to be you put a, a, a modem on a thing and connect it to a network, and it's sending very, it could, you know, early deployments sent very little data. They sent, you know, uh, proof of life data. You know, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. And then they'd send, you know, what I'd call alarm data. My thing is leaking. The gate is open. The, somebody has, you know, done something inappropriate. Here's an alarm. 
I guess my question is, you know, what are you seeing in terms of the progression from sort of sim simple, almost binary uh, bits of hardware to more intelligence at the edge? Yeah, I think, you know, I, I would definitely disagree that 5G is just another G. I think, um, you know, that the throughput is, is so huge, the amount of data that you can push down that I think it enables things that you couldn't do before. Um, you know, one of the things that really interests me that I, you kind of see rising at, the, at a similar time is this kind of emergence of augmented reality uh, devices, right? Which really are IoT devices because, you know, if you want to be truly wireless, um, you need to be able to have that kind of communication. And, you know, you think of, uh, of a worker who's maybe on a, on a factory floor or, you know, out in the field, um, being able to have a, a headset that can display real-time information that can be talking back to, you know, a central database, doing some analysis, getting information that's projected up in the real time, that, that simply wasn't possible with uh, the types of, of, uh, of communication that we had available to us before, right? I mean, you might be able to do it over Wi-Fi, but what happens when you're, you know, at a marina working on some huge engine on a boat? Well, you know, you don't have Wi-Fi. You don't have availability to that. And, you know, 3G certainly wasn't going to cut it. LTE probably isn't going to cut it. Um, and, you know, you combine that with the latency where, you know, you could potentially direct your site at something and within a millisecond, right, have some sort of information at, at you know, right there. So I think it really is interesting how we can uh, leverage that to, to do these new technologies. The other thing is there's new sensing modalities that are hugely data intensive that I think will really pair well with 5G. Another one that I'm really interested in is LiDAR. Right, the, the the breadth of things that you can do with lidar is is astounding, right? If you, if you dig into the literature a bit of what people have been doing, it's amazing. But the amount of data that gets generated is huge, right? It's these big point clouds that you have to be able to do something with. Um, the combination of being able to collect that data, do a little bit of edge processing, but then send it back for the heavy duty stuff, and then have that come back and complete the circle. Uh, I think that's going to enable some really cool applications in, you know, in mapping and sensing um, and in being able to interpret so, like what things are going on. Yeah. So it sounds, I mean, you're the first one to mention LIDAR in, in any of these conversations that I've had. Um, give me a kind of fine tune on the use case a little bit more. I mean, uh, a great example could be like mapping, right? You want to do live mapping as like of a changing environment. Uh, it, you could analyze, say, crowds looking at how a crowd is moving and how many people yep. are in an area. Okay. Those types of things can be doing done very uh, at a very kind of quantitative level with LIDAR um, with very specific data, but it requires a huge amount of data to do that, right? And it requires some pretty heavy-duty um, machine learning computations. And so, you know, being able to do part of that machine learning locally, so you might be able to get an, an instantaneous answer that's fit, like, let's say, 60% reliability, but then pipe that back from the field to the cloud, have the cloud churn on that and provide uh, an answer back really rapidly, which is where the 5G implementation could help. Um, you could you know, now increase that from 60% to 99% in just a few seconds, right? And so now you can really do these challenging imaging, 3D imaging pro image processing tasks that you can't get with just a camera um, and enable that uh, out, out in the field on the edge. No, I mean, and it's interesting. It makes sense. I mean, I used to be skeptical around AR, VR as being part of the, I mean, it's a different swim lane still to me in many ways than, than IoT, but, you know, it's still in the same pool, as much as I hate that analogy. <laughs> and I, and I abuse that analogy quite frequently. Um, I've seen VR sort of use cases around, you know, digital twin, I'm in a factory, and, you know, I can... Before I put my hand into the machine, I can go touch the machine virtually, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I, I, are you guys working with like, you know, Oculus or, or Vive or any of the, the, uh, the, the VR headsets as part of deployments yet? Or is it more uh, uh, experimental? Yeah, I think that's still kind of in the lab, so to speak. I think you're starting to see that come out. So that's in how you got them to bit. reimburse you for, for your Oculus headset is what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> I wish. Not, not yet. Maybe soon. But uh, yeah. uh, we don't have any current clients that are, are, are doing that. But I think it's, uh, you know, I've seen it both in, uh, you know, previous things that I've done. And, and I think you see it a lot in uh, the literature and, and in news right. articles that are coming out. But this is getting more and more. I, I will... Uh, I'll echo your, your skepticism that I, I myself have had. Um, but I think 
one of the things that I, I has sold me a little bit more, especially on on AR in the last few years, um, is I think the digital twin is really interesting. But then being able to go into uh, an area and have kind of live annotation of what you're looking at, right? So instead of having to have a manual there with you and you're flipping through pages, you know that information is live right there, and you can interact with it. You can bring it down. Uh, and I think things like that are, are really compelling use cases and, and could really change the way that, that folks work with, you know, industrial commercial type applications. Well, the other thing that's changed, I agree. The other thing that's changed is these VR handsets are now um, more and more emerging as untethered. In other words, there's exactly. not a hose behind, the, uh, behind your neck that follows you around. I remember looking, because I've been active with a VR company for a long time, I remember looking at early VR handset uh, uh, headsets, you know, goggles, and it, it required an, you know, first of all, a very, you know, uh, GPU heavy laden computer, uh, and, and you had this garden hose coming out the back, which was weird. So if you're interacting and you're turning around in a gaming scenario, you're tripping on a on a hose potentially, and you had to set up all these things in the corners of the rooms. So that you know it could track you, you could track it, and now I've seen just a tremendous amount of progress. That's for a different conference, not for connected things. But <laughs> you know, it, it's interesting to see how these related technologies are being brought back in and potentially uh, able to be incorporated in, in, from an IoT deployment. So um, as we kind of you know move through this, you know, we touched on this at the beginning, but again, recording this early summer, twenty twenty one. Um. COVID uh, impacted uh, so many different things in so many different ways. You guys were always a kind of distributed remote workforce. Has that benefited you? Has that, have you changed any of your operating philosophies based on a uh, year and a half extra of learning? Uh, how's, that, how's that impacting you guys? Yeah, I mean, certainly I think we had a leg up at the beginning of the pandemic because we had been doing, you know, fully remote for, for years now. Um, and so we didn't have that, that same learning curve that I think others had to, uh, had to kind of develop over the, you know, months of, of 2020 when folks were working from home. Um, and I think, you know, one thing that very learned early on is that, you know, we tried hybrid and, and didn't find that it worked for us. And so we kind of developed this, you know, fully remote posture. Um, and that required us to develop really good remote work hygiene, as we like to say, right? And so we have kind of a, a really set rhythm of work that I feel uh, enables us to be really successful. And, you know, successful not just doing software development, but building hardware too. Um, and so, you know, part of that is what you see behind me on my 3D printer and my bench is, making sure that we have the tools in the engineers' homes so that they can uh, do what they need to do. But then even outside that reaching to, you know, we have all these uh, great advancements that we have available to us from like robotic assembly of PCBs, rapid manufacturing. There's folks out there that can turn around parts very rapidly, right? I could go and drop a, a Gerber file to a, a manufacturer in an hour and probably by, you know, tomorrow or maybe the morning after, have that fully assembled circuit board in my hand, uh, you know, saving any chip shortages that we had to deal with. But right. um, we have all these 21st century, uh, you know, tools at our disposal. And one of the things that, you know, I think a lot of industry has done a really good job of adopting those 21st century tools, but they use them inside of like a 19th century engineering process. And so what we're really trying to do at Very is come up with this 21st century engineering process that leverages the 21st century tools. So uh, it, it, I, this is beyond calling it agile. This is, I mean, uh, can you, can, well, let me wrap two points together. There's the process and whether you're using your own methodology or, you know, uh, adhering to one of the popular trends. And then there's this other notion, our, uh, for lack of a better term, our sister or our allied conference that also runs at the Media Lab in the past or ran the, at the Media Lab was MTech that uh, uh, the MIT Technology Review Magazine would uh, host, they typically talk about the future uh, of work. And that's been sort of a trendy, trendy, trendy topic. But it's really the present of work uh, is, is really the, the question. So you're presently you know, in this COVID, post-COVID environment, and you've got these processes. How, how do those all blend together? I hope that made sense. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think, you know, the, the agile thing is, is big with very, um, one of my big, uh, I guess things that I'm working on is, is really defining what agile hardware means and making that process, uh, work. And so I think, you know, when you look out in industry, there's a lot of, I think people see agile hardware as almost a little bit of a dirty word, right? There's, there's been issues with it in the past. And I think a lot of that stems from folks taking, you know, a software engineering agile method. And they look at that book and they just scratch out software and they write hardware underneath it. And right. they say, oh, here, this is what we have to do. And what that fails to take into account is, is some of the fundamental differences between software and hardware, right? Like I can write an automated test for software. I can break that code repeatedly very quickly. To do that in hardware, you have to build something. Or you have to prototype it. You have to physically have it in front of you. Then you have to test it and break it. And so there's some real differences, but I think, you know, if you go back to kind of the fundamentals of Agile, there's no reason that those can't be applied to hardware as long as you do it in a very intentional way. And so that's what we're trying to do is not just, you know, carbon copy the software method over onto hardware, right. but then, uh, but to build a complementary process that can work alongside of it. Um, and, you know, when you kind of hybridize that with the fact that we work from home, um, it's it's actually not that different. It really just means at, at the base level, getting hardware in people's hands faster, right? And so instead of building one prototype, we build six and the whole team gets one. And like that might sound expensive, but for most of these things, you know, 80% of the cost is set up right. and the unit cost is low. And so you can churn up for maybe 20% more enough to go you know, all across the country, overnight shipping is, you know, like a miracle. You just yeah. click the button on FedEx and something shows up in, in San Diego the next day from Massachusetts, where I am. And like, you can have the whole team, you know, the software developer, the firmware developer, the program manager even can have, you know, the prototype on their desk, playing with it, testing it, um, and providing that feedback. And we can do that cycle many times in the program, right? And so we can kind of maintain that, that agile process, that agile velocity, and be worked from home. No, it makes sense. And we're kind of on the home stretch here as well. Um, so I guess, you know, the related point is assuming I'm going to make several uh, assumptions just for, just for, uh, for fun. Um, assuming there's no chip shortage, assuming, you know, everything that you need is available. If I come to you on a Monday at the first of the month with, here's my idea, or here's the project, it's funded, it's approved. Uh, at what point, do, you know, just rough, rough, you know, swags, what point do I get my first working prototype, you know, in, in weeks or months? And at what point am I really out the door with a, with a product that I can deploy? So I'll say specific times are hard because it's so dependent on the complexity of the problem. But um, so the thing behind, is, no, the thing yeah. behind you, whatever that yeah. enclosure is that you're printing uh, how, when did that project start and, and when do you hope to deliver? And obviously don't identify the client because that way you're not going to be get boxed in. But, you know, just I'm just trying to get rough time frames because my, I want my audience to understand, you know, the gestational cycle of a project. Mm. So I'd say from uh, from the white sheet of paper to the first kind of full functional prototype was, I would say it was about six to eight weeks. Uh, and that was oh. with, you know, uh, boards that were built by a uh, contract manufacturer, not hand. We, we had some hand soldered prototypes doing little things before that, but this was like the first one that was a, a PCBA that we got right. produced. Um, and I think, you know, we're, we're working right now on the second spin. I think that's been, we've probably been at it for three or so weeks now. We'll probably have another three or four weeks and then we'll be ready for, you know, what I like to call an initial production run. So we're not building 50,000 of these things all at once. Uh, you always learn something the first time you go to manufacturing. And so we like to build a couple hundred, right? And then get those out into the field, get some learning with those. Um, but the intent is that, you know, that piece that we're going to be um, doing that initial manufacturing one is, is basically ready, um, save for maybe small tweaks. And so that's, that's what, 16-ish weeks from yeah, white sheet of paper to, to being ready. Now that's I'd say that's on the low end uh, for for our programs, right? It just depends on level of complexity, but you know it's not uncommon for us to have uh, you know a functional prototype in in say six to ten weeks of uh, of work. That's remarkable. I remember it was like uh, I'll see you in a year. 
you know. It is, I, it is amazing how quickly we're able to, to, to do things. It even surprises me sometimes. And, and like I said, it's doing no small part to the fact that, I mean, this project in particular, we had uh, a board design, and four days later, we had fully assembled PCBAs arriving at the electrical engineer's house uh, for testing, which, I mean, you know, I, I, I haven't been in the field for that that long, but I remember when it was months before you'd see something from a, a PCBA house. And so right. it's, it's really remarkable how quickly we can get these. And, and the CMs are moving quickly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And wow. as long as you find the right partners, I think you can really do some things uh, very rapidly. Wow. Oh, it's interesting. So, uh, and then, you know, there's uh, acceptance and certification if certs are required. Do you guys handle the certs? Just quick add on question. Yeah, so we don't CRB, do CRB, FCC, and all that. We don't do it in house, but we have partners that we work with closely. Uh, right now, this is actually doing some PTC every testing um, out, in, out in San Diego with one of our engineers. And so, um, certainly, that's something that we work with our clients on. We have partners that we work with um, to get those things done. So if you're uh, at the enterprise level, just to, just to distill it without all the acronyms and letters and numbers and all that, you can go from sort of rumor or, as you said, blank sheet of paper to something working in your hand in a short matter of a couple of months, uh, validate that it does what you want it to do, and then you know contemplate putting it into production pretty quickly. So that turnaround cycle, and again, you know, with a 5G modem, 5G networks, uh, uh, attached to it, um, you know that turnaround cycle is pretty pretty fast. Parts are becoming available. That it, that's that's a big change from again a number of years ago. I mean, the term IoT was coined twenty one years ago, uh, and you know it was again it was like single little connector on a part that might spit out some uh, minor bits of data. So. Um, no, it's interesting. It's a, it's an it, uh, I, I, it's an interesting point to take from this. So we've talked about all about five G. Five G requires a hardware element. It just you know it's uh, you're you're making the things in the connected things context. So I think that's cool. So uh, on behalf of my audience, Bill, I want to thank you again. I want to thank your your firm, Very Possible, for being a long term sponsor of ours, and hopefully uh, we can continue to see some support from you and sponsorship. I do want to remind my audience that we're planning to be back uh, uh, with a small event in fall 2021, this fall, right after Labor Day, uh, date to be uh, announced, and then back with the full uh, Connected Things conference at the MIT Media Lab sometime in the spring, typically late March, uh, to avoid as much snowfall as possible. But Bill, however you pronounce your last name, I really, um, I really appreciate your time and, and your firm's support. and and your participation in in this uh, in this little discussion. Yeah, well, this was really great. It was a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me, and uh, yeah, I appreciated a chance to get to chat with you.